if you looked at our politics or our media, you would think that the North dominates this country, and it does. But the question is, why is that when the South clearly outperforms the North? I'm Barkhadat, you're with the Mojo Story. On the program today, we ask that important question when it comes to what one author has called India's Great Divide. The southern states on almost all indices of socio and economic development outperform the North. In fact, a new book, South versus North, in particular, shines a light on this great development divide. Whether it's health, whether it's education, whether it's midday meal schemes, whether it's girls staying longer in school, whether it's women having more opportunities of income, no matter which way you slice and dice it, the data does not lie. Despite this, it is the North that continues to dominate politics. There are now southern states that are worried about the imposition of languages and also believe that the center is undercutting these states when it comes to revenue collection. On the program today, we look at the debate triggered by this brand new book, South versus North. Let me introduce the book's author on the program today. Neela Kantan RS is the author of South versus North. Let's bring him up. Uh, great to see you there. Uh, Monda Spai, uh, who's of course an educationist, an industrialist, a venture capitalist. Uh, from the South, but spends a lot of time also doing uh, charity work in relation to education and children in the North. So has two perspectives. Great to see you, Mohan, as ever. And also joining us is Mitali Nikore, who's, of course, an economist. Uh, great to see all of you. We're also uh, expected um, uh, to have Gopal Krishnan Agarwal of the BJP, a chartered accountant by training, join us in a few moments from now. So, uh, Neela Kantan, let me start with you. Your book opens very evocatively uh, about what might happen to a young girl and you say uh, a girl first you know is is more likely to celebrate her fifth birthday if she's born in the south compared to the north and then you imagine this trajectory for this girl and almost on every uh, sort of possible measure she does better including staying in school staying in college and then having an opportunity to work uh, once she has a certain set of educational qualifications i don't think anybody is going to argue against that why do you think that is, though, the reasons for it is where the argument lies, not the fact of it. And your book throws up many interesting questions, including uh, population, but also raises an interesting question over whether subnationalism, a clearer sense of identity in the South, has driven better performance. Right. Um, so I, before I go into the details, I want to make this part clear. Right. Um, uh, the primary purpose of the book is to is to let the facts do the talking. I am a data scientist by training. I'm not an economist, uh, nor am I a social scientist. And therefore, uh, you know, the moment we propose one argument, there'll always be somebody else who gives the exact other argument. And it's very difficult to disprove what might have been. So it's, it's very easy for us to basically stick with the facts and basically say what you just said, which is that if a child were to be born in India, it's more likely to be born in northern India than in southern India simply because of the population growth, right? But let us assume that that child is in fact born in southern India. That child, you know, because of lower IMR, the child will see its first birthday. Because of lower MMR, its mother, uh, the child's mother will, you know, has a greater chance of living. Because of lower under five mortality rate, the child will see the fifth uh, birthday. And, you know, because uh, of uh, higher GER, that is the gross enrollment ratios, the child will go on to stay in school for long because uh, the southern states have a great a lower dependence on agriculture so to speak in terms of their uh, you know the contribution to the GSDP and their greater uh, 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 like how do I said urbanization vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the north uh, this this child is more likely to go find a manufacturing or a services job given the greater number of factories that are there in states like Karnataka and Tamil Nadu compared to the north uh, of course yeah. you, know, you, you can always argue where is Maharashtra I don't know if the Marathis themselves know if they're southern or northern, but uh, you know, let's leave that aside for a minute. But if you if you have this, so you basically have this particular part of the country where you generally have a more prosperous life. Now, the reasons for this are, you know, everybody can come up with a different argument. Like right? in Tamil Nadu, for example, the midday meal scheme has been a hundred year old scheme, right? Like, you know, there have been various fits and starts, but the one that was started in the 80s, in the early 80s, sort of kind of seems to have gotten something right because of what it did was in, in the next 10 years, uh, the 
greatest increase in terms of uh, the uh, uh, girls staying in school happened after that right and if you see the contribution of that the greater uh, generation later we have the greatest female labor force participation amongst you know those women went on to college and therefore it has resulted in like a, a, a dividend that no the policy makers 40 years ago did not even think of right so it, it, it's a it's a complicated thing now why did it, you know, it, it is nobody's argument that M.G. Ramachandran 40 years ago thought of female labor force participation as a reason for his midday meal scheme. He did not. But it's a pleasant accident of some kind, right? And therein lies the most important thing, which is that in a federal structure, what we want is for states to have the room and the luxury and the fiscal space to experiment with uh, uh, policies that they think are apt for their particular development trajectory. And, right. you know, and that I, I think should be the takeaway and not because if we basically were to argue for reasons, then we'll get into ideas of ethnic essentialism, which I don't want to get into. No, I, I, I didn't mean to say that, you know, by ethnicity or uh, by, by or, you know, that there's some kind of essentialism of origin, which explains why, why certain communities do better than the others. But certainly I'm sure the data has thrown up other questions, uh, the basis on which a state is organized, uh, how, how incentivized are the people of that state, for example, uh, to maintain their population level so that resources don't fall short. Uh, what is the larger culture uh, of governance? What is the larger culture of how people spend their money and what they spend or spend it on? I think there are many questions here. I can see uh, Gopalji of the BJP joining us. We'll come to him in a moment. Namaskar, sir, good to see you. Mohan, let me bring you right in. Uh, like I said, you're from the South, but you, you have uh, you know a lot of experience in the North as well. Uh, the North-South divide can get uh, very heated and I think that's what Neela Kanton is trying to avoid saying let's not get into the why let's look at the what uh, but can we understand the what without the why we need to get on, into let, yeah. yeah go ahead yeah we cannot because we need to get into reason first of all if you go back 100 years there has been many social reform movements in the south which are not in the north Kerala had the Ezawa Naran Guru movement then the communists came in they did reasonable work Tamil Nadu had the Justice Party Dravidian movement. Karnataka had the land reforms and the Wadiyar, you know, Maharaja was a, you know, welfare person. And then you also, but you did not have so much in Telangana and, uh, you know, Andhra Pradesh because there was the Nizam and then the Razakars and then you had the Naxalite movement. Okay. So there was empowerment in the South. We didn't have that in the North. Uh, but Maharashtra has something like that. Bengal was very good at the time of independence, but has gone down after the communist came. All right. Second thing is, in the South, everybody has focused on women education and education generally. You know, Barka, the birth rate is directly correlated to a woman's educational status. Postgraduates have one child. Graduates have 1.5 children. And, you know, an eighth class pass has maybe three to four. Fertility in the whole of the South is around 1.7. Bihar is 2.9. UP is now 2.6. Rajasthan is 2.4. Right? That is one. So if you don't have an educated workforce, especially women, you're not going to develop. The key focus for development has to be women education. You know, Barka, let me give you some data. When Mao took over in China in 1949, he said, women hold up half of heaven. He educated China's women. He was a totalitarian, and you know, you can blame him, but China has developed because of his women after opening with 78. When Nehru took over in 1950 after the constitution, he didn't educate India's women. So we have not paid attention to women and we are suffering. And where the woman education is better, the girl child is there, we see better. Tamil Nadu has a GR of 52%. And Bihar has a GR, gross enrollment rate of 13%. UP has 26%, has done reasonably well. And Karnataka has 36 And the Kerala has 36 So you look at human capital, human indices. Because, Barka, where you invested in humans, you are given good governance, you'll always have a better population, low fertility, better development. But you want to understand, Tamil Nadu is a very corrupt state. Karnataka is a very corrupt state. Despite that huge amount of corruption, they've done extremely well. I'll end by one piece of data. Karnataka's per capita GDP last year was 3 lakh 5,000. Tamil Nadu was 2 lakh 82,000. You know, UP with 22 crore population, only 81,000. Bihar with 11, 12 crore population, 11, 12 crore population, only 50,000. Bihar is a failed state. And you are seeing West Bengal, which has gone backwards from 1950 after freedom. So the big issue is social reform movements at one point of time an empower citizenry, which leads to a government which focus on people with spends. And this got nothing to do with the resources because today 70% of the total government spending is done by the states. Centers only 30%. 42% of the centers revenues barring custom duty goes to the states. 
So they got ample resources, but they invested in human capital into society for the last 30 years. They've seen the benefit. And after liberalization, they marketed the state better because they had an educated workforce. And the service industry came here. Karnataka service GDP is 66%. And if you look at uh, you know, uh, Uttar Pradesh, is 48%. So many yeah. reasons, but very happy Neil Kenton has made this analysis because we got to show that for any state to develop, focus on people, 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 and women in particular. Treat a woman with respect. Educate the girl child, and you will boom. Yeah, I think women at the heart of uh, of, of of the sort of the, the the success story is something we can all agree on. Uh, many of the other questions that Neil Kenton says are perhaps politically and socially polarizing, yet they're the elephants in the room that must be addressed. Let me bring in uh, Gopal Krishna Agarwal of the BJP. As I said, he's a finance person by training. Uh, you know, uh, Mr. Agarwal, how do you read the difference between the North and the South? You know, uh, why do you think the Southern states have outperformed the Northern states? And I'm not, you know, getting into a kind of BJP versus non-BJP politics here. It doesn't really seem to matter uh, who or which party uh, is leading these states. This is this is the bottom line, as it were. How do you read it? Barkhaji, I would like to hear mention two, three important points. First thing is, that uh, this north-south divide narration, etc., is not a very conducive system. It is having some kind of colonial notion where they were wanted to control the uh, Indian continent through various, whether it was Hindu-Muslim divide or Dravidian-Aryan divide or etc. This narration is not very conducive to the current political or uh, nationalist situation. But one thing I tell you, that there are certain states in the north, uh, in the south, which have performed well, and Mohandas Paiji uh, has uh, very well underlined those issues. Uh, the condition I tell you, because major invasion into the country came from north, and the uh, northern states they were continuously under foreign control, and there were fighting, invasions, partitions, so many historical background during the pre-colonial period, yeah, Mughal period or before that. Mm. So that disturbance has also contributed to some of the factors which uh, Mohandas Paiji has been underlining. But as such, we have to understand that the basically is the political setup contributing to this divide. I don't agree that this narration should be promoted. This is not conducive. But, but would it not help us? To, on the factual basis, I am telling you, on the factual basis, there are differences. And that has been, uh, the government has tried to bridge those differences through the Finance Commission allocation of resources. Where one thing I understand that the population growth in the north has been higher, certain educational level, Kerala has very good educational level, women empowerment has been seen. So. There are historical factors which I have underlined. The, those have contributed. Can I, can, I, can, I, can, I, can I ask you one brief question? And I, I could see Mr. Pai disagreeing when you framed it within colonial uh, sort of history. But uh, one of the questions that Neil Kanton, the author of the book, doesn't make this argument, but other political scientists have made this argument that perhaps subnationalism, the fact that all of these states have uh, a language around which, for, for example, people do identify. And right now, this is a hot topic because, again, uh, Hindi and Hindi in technical institutes etc is back in the news do you think Gopalji that that could be one of the reasons that when people feel more aligned uh, in identity states do better I don't know I'm just asking the question so if you look into the ancient history we take uh, the whole Indian culture if you look into the whole Indian culture or the prehistoric Vedas and other things uh, or Sanskrit development they are Culturally, South is very conducive to the Indian culture. The way they have been preserving all the Vedas are very important for the whole Hinduism. And I think the preservations of Vedas, have all the four sects of the Vedas are preserved. I have seen, I have been to Kerala, the way Shankaracharya has promoted the Vedic culture, Vedantic culture, all and so uh, Tamil uh, Tamil language is very well respected. The level of literature they have, the way um, uh, so Murugan or all uh, Madurai temples. So I, though I think he, the, superficially imposing this as a north south divide 
should be not get uh, we should not get into thing we only have to discuss okay. because of the historical reason north has seen major invasions major yeah. disturbances for more than correct can, can, can i bring in mohandas briefly and then the division but the uh, finance commission and other people our uh, allocation of resources etc are taking care of this, let, me, uh, let, let me jump in there, sir. Let me just jump in there because Mitali is waiting. And I need to go back to Neil Kanten as well. But Mr. Pai, you had a brief interjection. Yeah, Barka, I don't buy this argument about the past invasion. It's true. But let us look at history after 1757, after the Battle of Plaza, when we didn't have foreign powers except the British loot India. Let us look at data after 1947 and 1950, after we got a constitution. Let's forget the past. 75 years is a long period of time. When in 1950, West Bengal was the biggest economy in India. Now it is one of the smallest. Okay, what has happened? The South was very small in 1950. Now it has become big. UP was very big in 1950. Now it's become small. See, if you look at data after 1950 and study this, we no, find very... I respect you. Just one question. So you are saying there is... A, what is the cause of this difference? No, no, let me tell the cause of the difference. Gopalji, let me explain. And the data says that the cause of the difference is after 1950, when India became a constitution, the southern state focused on educating the people, having literacy, taking care of the women slowly, and they developed. Now, if you look at data after 1951, the divide between the south and the north has widened. And why is that? Because after 1991, Gopalji, let me finish. Let me finish. After 1991, the directed state economy went away. Then it depends on the state to market. So investment has flowed to the south because yeah. they have better educated workforce, better governance. So let so us. So does it all come from... down to education, Mohan? Uh -huh. For you, does it all come down? Education and women's welfare. Gopal, just Absolutely. hold your thoughts. Just hold your thoughts. Let's let's bring in uh, Mitali. Mitali, as a feminist economist, I'm sure has some things to say on that. Uh, Mitali, go ahead. Uh, thanks a lot, Barkha. And, uh, you know, thank you for including me in this debate. I think it's very interesting to see some of these historical trends. Even at Nikor Associates, we have been mapping the historical trends of female labor force participation in India. And we have obviously done that at a national level. And when we look at that national picture and then bring it down to the state level, it's very interesting to correlate with the analysis that Neil Kandan has done. Because when we look at the national female labor force participation rate from 1955 to 2020-21, the turning point happens to be 2004-05 and then 11-12. And that's when you see a large exodus of rural women go out of the workforce. And now this large exodus of rural women actually happened in many of the southern states. I mean, if you also, you know, uh, correlate with Maharashtra being a southern state. And some of the northern states like UP, Bihar, etc., you don't see that many women moving out. I meant as a delta, not in terms of the levels. Now, if we now today, 2020, where we stand post COVID, UP, Bihar, they have very low female labor force participation rates. Bihar stands at 10.9%. On the other hand, in the southern states, like Andhra Pradesh is the leader at 50%, Telangana also 50%, Tamil Nadu 46%. Now, this is far higher than the national average of 32.5%. So where are we and why have we reached here? It's really a matter of women's education, yes, but also the missed opportunities in many of the northern states because of structural transformation of the economy. Women right. kept on being employed in agriculture. Men were moving on to manufacturing and services. And this was seen much more in the southern states, but in the northern states, women didn't have an opportunity and hence moved out altogether. Okay, can I can I bring in Neil Kanton? You know, you've heard varying perspectives already, historical uh, from from Gopal Agarwal's perspective, uh, education and focus on women from Mr. Pai and, and Mitali's perspective. Uh, you your book also looks at flagging some fears uh, fears in the southern states about the center. Uh, 
undercutting southern states. There's a huge fight ever since the GST came into being. The, the GST was actually a brainchild of the previous government, executed to the last mile by this government. Uh, you talk about the fears of delimitation, not having it, enough influence in parliament. Let me bring you uh, uh, into, into that uh, thread of our conversation. Go ahead, Neelkant. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, sort of uh, touch about what Mr. Anwar said uh, briefly, uh, which is that, you know, the historical reasons. I just want to point that in the uh, late 19th century and the early 20th century, the British, uh, the colonial administration constantly taught that the straight, uh, the, the uh, uh, Travancore, that is the princely state of Travancore, was essentially a basket case, which, uh, you know, uh, uh, had to be uh, sort of merged with the Madras presidency because it was, you know, absolutely casteist and had like really, really bad indices all over. So this argument of historical, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, Play, uh, you know, uh, historical reasons as to why the present is, you know, as good or as bad as it is, it sort of doesn't hold water. Similarly, in the uh, at the time of 1947, the United Provinces, what is now Uttar Pradesh, was a relatively well-administered province, and it was in the middle of what, uh, you know, the colonial administration's overall British Raj was. So, uh, what we need to look at, like Mr. Pai said, is what have we done in the last 70 years when we've had the agency, right? And uh, the second thing that I want to sort of bring about is... Uh, this is precisely what the book sort of uh, points to as troubling areas, which is because uh, we've, uh, you know, Southern India has sort of sent its girls to school and uh, sending girls to school is the greatest contraception invented by man, which is, uh, you know, and because of that, our total fertility rate uh, in Kerala, in Tamil Nadu, in Andhra Pradesh, uh, uh, in Karnataka, they're like, you know, at the levels of what China, after a generation of one child policy has achieved. Right now, the, we did not have a you know gun at uh, uh, people's heads, but just sent girls to school, and the result of that is that we have a fertility rate of 1.6 or 1.7. So, and 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 this was you know this is after the compact of of the 42nd amendment to the constitution under the Indira Gandhi administration during emergency. Yeah. I mean, it's a terrible uh, sort of a illiberal piece of legislation, but at the end of the day, it fixed the uh, representation in parliament uh, to what was you know 1971 census levels. What now happens? Is that you know we you know we, we extended it once in 1999 under the uh, and now it's up and now it's up for happening again let's yes. yeah and and, and uh, so so let me just add one more thing so there is we we, we have better uh, sort of you know we have different policy prerogatives at this point we have declining political influence and then like Mr Agarwal said the finance commission is actually instead. Uh, from the 15th Finance Commission has started taking the 2011 uh, population as the basis for allocation ratios, which further hurts South Indian states, right? So we have a triple whammy. We, we have a declining population. We have a, 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 a you know, a, a lesser ability to influence, you know, the, the uh, union finances. Yeah. Can, I, can I bring in Mr. Agarwal now? I think I, I think he must uh, be wanting to respond. Mohan, give me a second. Let's bring in Gopalji. Gopalji, go ahead. A uh, lot of fighting, as you know, uh, over states saying that after GST, you know, we are at an unfair uh, sort of position to collect revenues independently. And you've heard the points made by Neil Kanton. Go ahead. Barkaji, I'll just tell you one thing that uh, I basically this north-south divide narration, I'm not agreeing to it. There are differences, okay. I agree. There are differences between some of the states doing very well in the south and some of the states were doing very poorly in the north. But if I talk because I belong to the North Uttar Pradesh, it may not become a North South that I am. <laughs> I don't want to yeah. get into that. But I agree these are differences and the uh, and our, these differences I have underlined. What are the reasons? What I understand. But the thing is that we have to we need to correct those differences. And I don't under. Uh, uh, Classify it into a north-south divide. But can you can you classify it into states believing today? Let's talk yeah, about yeah. a federal a federal uh, conversation. Let's I'm make it a conversation about federalism so, and not just north versus yeah, yeah. south. So it is, but the it specific is worry in the south. Of, the but the specific worry in good. the south, sir. The specific yeah. worry in the south is that the number of seats that represent their population could reduce after delimitation. Hence, I ask the south specific. So then, then the larger debate will come to this. Should we do we need a population control policy? Oh. So, no, yeah. so when, <laughs> so when you started talking, where and we've gone no, where? Yeah. No, yeah. If you're talking, that is the only answer then. You need a population control policy because if these kind of divi division are only based on the population, 
if there is a, a, a religious based population difference if there is a south north uh, geographical based population difference so this is not the thing where i am arriving at i am telling you the thing is in the finance commission allocation earlier there was a bias based on population and the sub, many of the states in the north have seen a population growth which is higher than the south south has been because of education and other reasons many of the states have done well on the fiscal control uh, the 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 uh, uh, population control etc so therefore if, if uh, 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 where what i want to uh, underline here is now in the 15th finance commission i have discussed with nk singh ji also it is only population is getting a weightage of only 15% there is a fiscal responsibility there are uh, weightages given I, i can give you the data there is a clear cut the uh, situation where these factors are more and more being incorporated if okay. you are doing good on the fiscal side if you are doing good on the social parameters you will be incentivized and we think if we need to more and more get into this that we incentivize better performance on the population control fiscal control uh, the, the other social parameters these have to be incorporated so that states like bihar which are just called a bimaru state do not get the benefit of their incentivized because of their backward let they are get getting incentivized this is the real reason and if you i have been to telangana barkha ji telangana there is a corruption poverty everything is there very limited areas are there are islands of uh, development and if i have been to kerala also you cannot say ki kerala is a very well developed uh, state that there is no industry there is no occupation only thing is people are uh, uh, occup- uh, uh, employed in the other places and they are sending that is the prosperity well, well, uh, the model which well, kerala is undertaking yes, now you are discussing no, individual no, states so it becomes a political state. it becomes a political conversation but no no i have told in the north let me bring in mr pai let me bring in mr pai kerala and telangana example andhra has done good i accept tamil nadu has also done good Okay. Also I, to- I, 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 on a light, in a lighter vein, I mean, the South is outperforming the North even when it comes to cinema. Uh, that is clearly, I think, something <laughs> we're seeing, uh, which is which is very interesting. It's really we have to remark on it. I mean, your biggest hits nationally on the big screen are now coming from the South, and they're being lapped up in the North, uh, really upending the uh, the classic language debate. But oh, we should not ahead. take it into a racial kind of. No, thing. no, I know. I'm just making a light, light out of the way. Right, because of the. racial or ca- ca- no, capability no. differences no but, uh, no no but uh, go ahead mohan mohan yeah uh, barka i don't buy this uh, fiscal argument that uh, south is subsidized or not i don't buy it because we are one single country and those who are prosperous and obligation to give money to the less prosperous for very many reasons because we are one country we want all indians to have the necessities of life on that we should not have an argument and second the people in the south like this dravidians in tamil nadu who shout from the rooftops every time to look at their own budget how they use the money they have and you know they got a for example tamil nadu if i remember right has got a fiscal deficit of 1 lakh crore maybe the highest in the country because they use a large part of the taxation revenue to give subsidies to the well off section of society despite having a per capita income of 2 lakh 82000 so they must reallocate money if they're not doing it because of appeasement and all that so i don't buy neil kandel's argument about that so i agree with the finance commission we must support the north we must support the poorest state and barka let me tell you one more thing as an indian i would like the whole of the north to come to bangalore and stay here because we got better jobs people must stay where they are <laughs> and, and, and better we are better, 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 better weather on. but terrible traffic hang on. by the hang way on, but hang yeah. on we got we got yeah. very bad traffic i agree but no uh, what i'm saying is we must make sure people get the necessary life where they are they develop the state because we shouldn't don't want, otherwise it'll create another tendencies so i don't think this economic argument like i said 70% of government spending is by the states not the center center's role in fiscal policy is becoming less and gst has been very good because the consuming states get most of the revenue directly the balance is divided but barka the big issue the big issue for us is what are the seats in parliament going to be after delimitation from 1971 to 2011 i think the south population including maharashtra and orissa came down to 25% from 30% and let me tell you on record i in the south in bangalore don't want to be ruled by people from up 
I don't want our share in parliament to come down. I'm saying as an Indian and as a Kadi ga. So we must find a solution where the South does not get penalized for developing fast, having better policies and having a lower population growth rate. In terms of money, we have to support. In terms of political power, the South is a minority. And I don't want Gopal ruling over me. I don't mind working with Gopal to rule the country. So we got to handle that very carefully. And that is going to be a big conflict in the next okay. five years. I, I, I think that is going to be a big conflict. It's going to actually, it, it's something we should anticipate because it could really blow up uh, in, in terms of an uh, identity battle. But Mithali, Mr. Pai touched upon the Ravidi uh, debate, the freebies debate. The election commission is now in it. Where is that line between uh, freebies uh, leading to a high fiscal deficit and actually socioeconomic indices being better? Because, for example, you have the state subsidizing health care, uh, education, girls' education. It's a thin line. I'm not an economist, so I'll take that to you. Thanks. Thanks, Barka. So I think just reacting very quickly to one or two points uh, that were made, I think Dr. Uh, Gopal also talked about islands of development in the advanced states. I think that's a very important approach. And the Government of India's aspirational districts program is actually a very innovative way to look at how do we decentralize development because there we are not looking at states. We're looking at you know the smallest common denominator that can be managed from a national perspective. So I think we have to think more about aspirational districts and, and more targeted. And that actually relates with your question on freebies, that you know, how do we now deliver certain essential public services? What do we deem as essential public services? I mean, if we look at the RBI paper that's come out just recently, it's clearly defined what is a freebie and what is a subsidy. Now, we may agree or disagree with that definition. I, for one, don't fully agree with that definition. I don't think that free education should be termed as a freebie. But at yeah. the same time, we have to find better ways of delivering public services and social protection. And more targeted social protection is inevitable given the fiscal constraints that we are dealing with. I so think that's a very yeah important point. Two important points there about aspirational districts, two about the distinction between a freebie and a state-protected social right, right to health, right to education, right to equality. Uh, I'm actually out of time. Neil Kanton, do you want to come in with a, a quick closing thought? And same for Gopal and Mohan. Neil Kanton? Sure. Uh, I just want to react to a few things. One is, you know, in the time that the midday meal scheme was introduced in 1982, it was attacked as the most fiscally profligate scheme ever. The benefits of that ball of gruel is the higher female labor force participation rate today because of which, you know, Fair. Tamil Nadu has its per capita income to be what it is. Second, uh, on the Finance Commission, I just want to disagree with Mr. Agarwal, which is that if you go into the appendix of the 15th Finance Commission, the problem that I have is that he's right in that they have had population performance as a factor, but they've actually scaled all those factors with the 2011 population, which basically correlates more with 2011 population than with 1971. It's a, you know, it, it's almost like like some bureaucrat decided that nobody is going to read the appendix. Hmm. Okay. Mr. Agarwal, quickly, last thoughts? Quick shot. Uh, uh, the, yeah. uh, I would just underline two points. One thing is 2011 is the base year because uh, 2021 there was no uh, census. And once this new census comes, the things will be more, uh, uh, will be taken care of. Second thing is when Mr. Mondas Pai has said that delimitation is one big worry we should work on it i agree that delimitation is one issue which can uh, disbalance some of the issues that they have to be seriously thought these are the issues if uh, you are underlining those issues we have to work on that and the third thing that i would like to there are many things with the uh, north northern states which are backward not only uh, i will not yeah. block uh, put a north block like that the northern states have to learn many things on the social welfare, education, etc. And uh, South also has to learn many things on the election, the amount of money being spent on the uh, elections, on single seat. What is from where that money yeah. is coming? Yeah. The level of corruption is too high. And uh, the Telangana is a completely fiscally failed state. Uh, it's a completely yeah. bankrupt state. So, so the, they don't have. Pay, uh, refund. They are not even refunding the 
tax which have the advanced tax we'll, they we'll, have... we'll have a we'll have a separate conversation on telangana yeah. uh, with representatives of the telangana uh, ruling yeah, party as well who can argue with you i have to close mr pai any last thoughts yeah. sorry go ahead to interrupt you yeah. sure yeah. one day qu quickly yeah the economic and social divergence between south and north will widen in the next 10 years so this delimitation is going to be a very important exercise but i'm very heartened by what yogi adityanath is doing in up we can have a separate program and i'll point out if up does well grows faster than india some of this divide will become less because up is 17% of india and bihar is a gone case bihar with maybe you know 11 crore population we don't see you know nitesh doing anything not the debate in the place and is pathetic i feel very sad to me up madhya pradesh rajasthan are the great hope if they get their act together they use the resources properly the divide will come down and we'll have a better india i think these are the two points i want to make okay we'll have to leave it there i know there have been many reactions to what you just said including on up yogi adityanath and and all the rest of it but all of these conversations invariably end up in politics we try to steer clear of that today and look at uh, the numbers dispassionately and agree on a few things uh, but yes uh, there are debates imminent language delimitation and uh, you know states i won't say north or south states uh, asking for more federal rights to gather revenues and raise their own revenues uh, these are all complex and important questions thank you neelkanthan for your book for triggering the debate uh, to vitali to mohandas pai and to gopal agarwal pleasure as always and to our audience thank you for watching see you soon it's great to see you here thank you for watching our work If you haven't subscribed yet don't forget to click the bell icon and subscribe to Mojo Story and support independent robust journalism